shooters at large. They, I guess they. Before we proceed, I'd like to briefly turn over the meeting to two of our two of eight outstanding students who will receive the President's Award tonight. Please welcome to the dais Adeline Ava Acosta from Glen Cove Elementary School and Caitlin Cervantes from J.M. Hanks High School. Thank you, President Ochoa, and good evening. My name is Kaylin Cervantes from L J M Hanks L High School, and this is Adeline Eva Acosta from Glen Cove Elementary School. It is my honor to call this meeting to order. Good evening and welcome to the Sleta Independent School District's meeting of the Board of Trustees. The meeting of the Board of Trustees is a meeting of the board that the public is allowed to attend. As, pro as provided is letter ISD policy BED, we invite members of the public to make comments during the citizens' input portion at the start of the meeting according to the instructions provided with the electronic posting notice of our meeting. Legally, the board may listen but may not enter into its discussion on the matters and citizens' input. We remind that everyone that this is a board meeting often attended by students and ask that we all conduct ourselves in a manner that best represents the values and traditions of the Isleta Independent School District. This meeting of the Board of Trustees is called to order at 6.03 p.m. We have a quorum with Shane Haggerty, Soltero Ramirez, Mike Rosales, Catherine Lucero, Connie Woodruff, and myself, Cruz Ochoa. Trustee Bustillos is unable to join us and is considered excused. Trustee Rosales, please introduce our junior ROTC. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It has become a tradition to honor our nation at each of our board meetings, presenting the colors, reciting the pledges of allegiance, and then posting the colors. The colors tonight are being presented by the junior ROTC color guard from Eastwood High School. The color guard commander is Cadet Captain Tepney Alvarez. The other color guard members are Cadet First Sergeant Carlo Galvan, Cadet Sergeant Erza De Anda, Cadet Private First Class Star Rimpole. The pledge leader is Sergeant First Class Karina Martinez. Will you please stand for the presentation of the colors, reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance, the Texas Pl uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and a moment of, of silence. Please remain standing until the cadets have departed. gentlemen, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, 
one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now, please join me in the pledge to the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Dr. De La Torre, do we have recognitions and introductions this evening? Good evening, President Ochoa, members of the board, esteemed guests, we do. Uh, I invite uh, our Chief Human Capital Management Officer, Mrs. Bobby Russell Garcia, to lead in our introductions and recognitions this evening. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. De La Torre. We have four recognitions for you this evening. At this time, we ask all trustees to please come to the front of the dais for the presentation. Audience members, please remain seated until the recognitions are complete. Thank you. Tonight we begin with two winners of our President's Award. Our first winner is a group honor for the Inter Interact Club at Hanks High School, which organized the 22nd annual Hanksgiving in November that provided Thanksgiving meals for 540 families in need. These seven students enthusiastically dedicated themselves to writing letters, speaking to business leaders, and coordinating the participation and contributions of feeder schools, a huge task that takes an enormous amount of organization in addition to organizing Thanksgiving, the club also helped cook 25 turkeys to prepare 280 individual meals for a local church. We honor their contributions tonight with the February 2023 President's Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome tonight's first President's Award, award winners, the J.M. Hanks High School Interact Officers. Here to represent the Interact Club is President Kaylin Cervantes. Vice President Judith Olivas. Secretary Abel Sanchez. Treasurer Alexa Heck. Merit Manager Isaac Olguin. PR Chair Jacqueline Hawkes. Committee Chair Cindy Be Sydney Bejerano. They are accompanied by Principal Ruben Cadena.
Let's hear it again for the Hanks Interact Club. Our next President's Award goes to Glen Cove Elementary School second grader, Adeline Eva Acosta, a true Glen Cove Star Scholar. Last winter, she took it upon herself to gather donations of blankets to help those in need in El Paso. And this winter, she is also helping organize care packages to give to the homeless in our community. In addition, Adeline volunteers with her church to help feed the elderly at the Casas de las Abuelitas. Adeline's teacher describes her as a generous and kind student who is always willing to help in any area needed. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our second President's Award winner, Adeline Eva Acosta from Glen Cove <laughs> Elementary School. She is accompanied by Principal Margarita Mendoza. Let's hear it once again for Adeline. Our next recognition honors high school students who won first place in team and individual categories at the Texas Public Service Teachers Association Regional Competition in December. Students competed in several law enforcement events including forensic science, fire search and rescue, traffic stop, crime scene investigation, accident investigation, and intoxicated driver among others. All winners advance to state competition in March in Corpus Christi. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first place winners from Bel Air High School in Forensic Science. We have Antonia Arias. <laughs> Gael Hernandez. <laughs> Michelle Olivas. <laughs> and Lizette Hernandez, who also won in the individual fingerprinting category. And winning the Bunker Gear individual category is Timothy Haggerty. They are accompanied by teacher Anthony Canonziado and principal Jake Valtiera. Let's hear it again for the Highlanders. <laughs> Next, we have Del Valle High School. In the Honor Guard Team category, please welcome Eileen Arellano Garcia. <laughs> Miriam Reyes. Winners in the Fire Agility Co-Ed Team category are Juan Carrasco, Diego Estrada, who also won in the individual male Fire Agility competition, Edgar Martinez, in the Team EMT competition, we have Jutsi Limas, Cassandra Perez, Last, last but not least, we have our individual team event winners, Kayla Sines in Female Fire Agility, and Jaime Camacho in Fire Search and Rescue. The students are accompanied by teacher Juan Lopez, 
and Principal Ivan Cedillo. Let's hear it again for the Conquistadores. Next, from Eastwood High School, let's welcome the first place winner in the misdemeanor traffic stop individual category, Christopher Moreno. He is accompanied by teacher Jose Chinoa, and Principal Bonita Torres. Let's hear it again for the troopers. <laughs> Next, we have Hanks High School. Winning first in the crime scene investigation team category is Paula Buenrostro. <laughs> Emma Fehi. <laughs> Mildred Mendoza. and Carolina Segoviano, who also won in the closing arguments competition. And winning first place in the individual opening statement is Joshua Ortega. They are accompanied by teacher Ernesto Saucedo and principal Ruben Cadena. Let's hear it again for the Knights. <laughs> Next, we have Parkland High School. Bringing home first place in the felony traffic stop team category is Anisha Alcarez. Edmund, Edmund Baker. Victoria Ortiz. And Laisha Torres. In the cell extraction team category, we have Tiffany Baker, who also won first place in the individual accident investigation competition. <laughs> Ricardo Candelaria. Jose Jimenez, who also won first place in the individual intoxicated driver competition. Emmanuel Romero. And Jasmine Serrano. They are accompanied by teacher Sylvia Weaver.
Let's hear it again for the Matadors. My apologies for the delay. Next, we have Riverside High School. In the Domestic Disturbance Team category, please welcome first place winners, Mia Estrada. In the Building Search Team category, we have Emmanuel Lopez. Jeanette Luna. And Syra Velasquez. And winning first place in the individual male police PT agility category is Miguel Bermudez. They are accompanied by teacher Raul Hernandez and assistant principal Ben Melendez. Let's hear it again for the Rangers. And from Isleta High School, the individual booking procedure winner is Michelle Robles. And winning first in individual female police PT agility is Renee Alexis Tamayo. They are accompanied by teacher Nicholas Torres and principal Judy Calderon. Let's hear it again for the Indians. Our next recognition honors seven Isleta ISD dance students who were named to the Texas Dance Educators Association All-State Dance Team, which is comprised of students from throughout the state. All-State dancers participated in a convention experience in January that included dance workshops, leadership training, master classes, and networking with other students, culminating in a performance led by a master choreographer. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome members of the All-State dance team, beginning with Bel Air High School student, Olivia Paris Granberry. She is accompanied by teacher Suzanne Salazar Paz, and Principal Jake Valtiera. Del Valle High School student, Evelyn Amaya, who is accompanied by teacher Gloria Tinajero Tovar, and Principal Ivan Cedillo. Eastwood High School student, Lorena Evans, accompanied by teacher Amanda Magana and principal Bonita, Bonita Torres. Hanks High School student, Syria Perez, who is accompanied by teacher Crystal Nazari and principal Ruben Cadena. Parkland High School student, Deyanira Garcia. <laughs> Accompanied by teacher, Crystal Ortiz. 
Young Women's Leadership Academy student, Alyssa Torres, who is accompanied by Associate Superintendent of Middle Schools, Dr. Katherine Kennedy. And Isleta High School student, Ayana Gabriela Medina, accompanied by teacher, Corina Valdez, and principal, Judy Calderon. Let's hear it one more time for our talented dancers. Okay. Tonight's final recognition honors students from Parkland Pre-Engineering Middle School and Eastwood High School who are named winners of the Congressional App Challenge for the 16th District represented by Honorable Veronica Escobar. These students designed a variety of innovative apps that are relevant to the El Paso community. They include the first place winning app called Do Nation that allows people to donate and request money, food, and health items in this challenging economy, a bilingual app that helps Spanish speakers with their English skills, and a recycle learning app that teaches how to recycle and compost. To help us congratulate these outstanding students tonight, please welcome Congressman Escobar's District Representative, Ms. Priscilla Contreras. Good evening, Dr. De La Torre and YISD Board of Trustees. My name is Priscilla Contreras, and I am a District Representative for Congresswoman Veronica Escobar, who represents the 16th Congressional District of Texas. It is my distinct honor to be here with you all this evening on behalf of Congresswoman Veronica Escobar to recognize YISD students from Parkland Pre-Engineering Middle School and Eastwood High School who participated in and won the 2022 Congressional App Challenge. The Congressional App Challenge is a nationwide competition that encourages middle and high school students to learn how to code by creating their own applications. The App Challenge is intended to highlight the value of computer science and STEM education. Each year, a student from the 16th Congressional District of Texas is chosen by Ver Congresswoman Veronica Escobar and a panel of judges. Last year's judges were Eduardo Seifert from Blue Origin, Brandon Silverstein from Hello Amigo, Nadia Karichev from the El Paso Community College, and Fernando de Leon from Innovare. For the 2022 App Challenge, the Congresswoman's office received a total of 88 submissions from across four middle and high schools within the 16th Congressional District of Texas. I am proud to recognize the following winners from YISD. In first place, the app called Donation by Aurora Shindo, eighth grade from Parkland Pre-Engineering Middle School. For best technical delivery, Go Run by Stephen Hatem, 11th grade from Eastwood High School. For most educational, biling bilingo by Anel Ponce, 8th grade from Parkland Pre-Engineering Middle School. The app that solves the most relevant problem, Recycle Learning by Adrian Sanchez and Dylan Van Lee, both in sixth grade at Parkland Pre-Engineering Middle School. <laughs> the 
Lastly, for the fourth year in a row, the teacher with the most submissions, Ms. Raquel Haggerty, former STEM coordinator from Parkland Pre-Engineering Middle School. Our first place winner, Aurora Shindo, alongside all other participants, will be recognized during a reception hosted by the Congresswoman later this spring. Additionally, Aurora's app will be showcased to members of Congress and the broader tech community during the House of Code Festival in April. Congratulations to all winners, and thank you for your ongoing participation and support of the Congressional App Challenge. Thank you, Ms. Contreras. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me congratulate from Parkland Pre-Engineering Middle School, the first place Congressional App Challenge winner, eighth grader Aurora Shindo. Winner of the most educational app, eighth grader Anel Ponce Rodriguez. And winners of the Solve the Most Relevant Problem app, sixth graders Adrian Sanchez and Dylan Van Lee. They are accompanied by their teacher, Christopher Whitman and Principal Dr. Angela Reyna. Our final winner for Best Technical Delivery App is Eastwood High School Junior, Stefan Hatem. He is accompanied by Principal Bonita Torres. Let's hear it once again for our Congressional App Challenge winners. This concludes our recognitions for tonight. Thank you.
All right, uh, let's see. Trustee Lucero, do we have citizens' input this evening? No, not this evening, President Ochoa. What was that? What did she say? No, sir. Thank you. Dr. De La Torre, do we have any reports with us this evening? Yes, President Ochoa, members of the board, this evening it is my pleasure to welcome our new internal auditor, uh, Mrs. Amy Sanchez, who is going to give a report to the board. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to present our um, proposed internal audit annual plan for 2023 and to uh, accept your feedback. Before I get into the plan, I just wanted to also take a moment to update you on um, some revised processes and what we've been up to the last few weeks during this transitionary period. We took a look at our internal processes, including how we do audits, how we issue reports, how we communicate with our auditees, and we've made improvements where we saw opportunities. These were then uh, documented in a revised internal audit department policies and procedures manual. Also included in there is our new risk assessment template. Uh, we conducted a risk assessment for this year, which led us to our, uh, our audit plan, which we'll discuss in a moment. Our risk assessment is basically we identified um, our audit universe, what we refer to as our audit universe, which is basically a list of all the possible areas we can audit. Then we analyze those and rank them according to risk. The highest ones then were um, placed onto our audit plan. We also do have a vacancy right now. It's been posted and advertised. It's the position that I previously occupied. We've also continued working to um, finalize the audits from last year, which we hope to present to you um, soon. I also just wanted to share this quick definition of internal auditing. This is um, the definition of internal auditing provided by the Institute of Internal Auditors, the IIA. Now that group is the leader in our um, profession, in the internal audit profession, and they provide um, international standards on how inter internal audit offices conduct their audits, as well as they uh, do certifications and provide some technical guidance. And just a couple of um, words to highlight here are independent and objective. Um, and just to reiterate, we are independent and objective because of our reporting structure. The Internal Audit Office, as you know, reports directly to the board. So that helps us to be independent and objective. Also, just quickly, um, we do have a code of ethics that we are to adhere by. These are the four principles, and it is also part of the IIA standards. In order to ensure that we provide a relevant and reliable service, we do have to adhere to these four. First, integrity. Of course, the way we conduct ourselves and the way we conduct our audits must be in a way that generates um, trust from you, from our auditees, and from the public. Uh, again, objectivity. We, in order to um, provide a fair and balanced ass assessment, our work can't be unduly influenced. Next is confidentiality. We are privy to very sensitive information and we must keep that secure. We cannot disclose information without the appropriate authority. And finally, competency. In order to provide that value added service, we do have to possess the required skills and knowledge. So on to the development of our audit plan. As I said, it uh, was risk-based, and that is in compliance with the internal audit standards that we try to adhere to. This is a quick overview of our audit plan. There's three main categories. The audit projects, which we um, provide the, uh, the final audit report to you. We do also have our hotline reviews, as you're aware. We have a, a fraud, abuse, and waste hotline where anyone can um, call anonymous, excuse me, 
anyone can call anonymously and um, report on. And finally, the other activities, including professional development, other administrative um, work. Now within that first line item, audit projects, um, we further defined these are our areas of focus. So these are in a few different categories. Um, campus audits takes up um, a good chunk that uh, we will do campus audits on more of a cyclical basis and not only at um, the change in management, not just when a principal leaves. Um, those are our goals, the numbers there on how many campus audits we'll do. And we still will review the cash handling processes, fundraising procedures, look at attendance, in particular absence coding, and other types of coding such as PEMS and levers. Next chunk is our um, non-campus risk-based, excuse me, risk-based audits. A lot of these are compliance related. Um, we will look at it in terms of state and federal and local regulations, the accuracy of the reporting. Um, as you can see, some of the items there are um, sources of our, some of our major funding. We do have a few audits left over from last year that we are working on completing and we're um, close to finalizing those. We will continue to do follow-up audits from 2022, uh, and we do have an annual inventory review that we do um, in collaboration with the external auditors. And um, right now I'll take your feedback. I'll leave it on this screen, um, and uh, any questions or input that you have. Um, Thank you. Um, Ms. Sanchez, thank you for the report and, uh, and welcome to YSD. We're glad to have you here. Um, one of the uh, considerations has been kind of a historical thing is that we've asked that the superintendent's office and the board of trustees, since we share a budget, um, get audited every year. And I, and I was looking at uh, your, your risk assessment, mm -hmm. and even though we're, because I, and as you explained to me before, even though, even though we're a low risk because of the number of dollars, a few dollars that we spend, um, we still, uh, you know, I strongly believe that we need to show the public and we need to show our learning community that we're accountable as well too, um, and so much accountable that, that every, that annually we get reviewed. And, and we go through all that process. And so uh, we don't move a whole lot of money and we don't mm -hmm. you know, do those things that the campuses do, but we're still accountable. So uh, I'd, I'd like to see that inside the, the plan uh, or maybe the risk assessment higher or, or something special that says this needs to be sure, done annually. Sure, sure. We can so. absolutely add that as a routine audit every year. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> On the, anybody else? Uh, and the percentages that you and your hours on the on, on the hotline reviews are these uh, pretty much based on what has uh, transpired over the years? You know, it it really varies each year, um, mm -hmm. but we try to keep it more or less in line historically. But um, there can be times when there is a, a call that uh, that turns into an investigation that does take some time, but. Um, this is what we're approximating right now. Is this like a medium? Excuse um, me? Is this like a in between a medium from, yes. from high and low? Okay. Yes. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I just want to make a comment. I, I appreciate the, the thoroughness, at least to give us an overview uh, of what we can what we can expect as you go through the process of, of doing your job. And I appreciate that. It's good guidance, a good, good oh, abso direction. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Are you gonna discuss your internal, um, I mean, your risk assessment plan that's set your, tonight? Because you want it for- Well, our risk assessment, I believe, is uh, presented to you as part of the and the internal audit plan. I don't have slides on here right now, but I can um, discuss it further, how we... Well, it's up for vote, and I... I well, the, the audit plan uh, that... Oh, it's just the audit plan? Yes. Oh, okay. Not the internal audit uh, 
It's only the audit plan that is required um, to be approved. Oh, okay, so and just the hours. Yeah. Yes, and the items. So right. we will um, add the suggestion for a routine annual audit of the board uh, expenditures. We will add that to the plan. Can we touch up on your risk assessment plan? Sure. I mean, it's in, it's in here. Okay. I mean, what? it's... Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just asking. Okay, okay based on, uh, on the risk assessment plan, uh, you had several categories that you were going to look at, right? Yes. Okay. One was management interest, budget risk, mm -hmm. strategic risk, compliance risk, reputation risk, uh, time since last audit, change in management, and okay. So uh, the weighted uh, totals were based on which ones were uh, you considered uh, to be the top categories as far as risk, is that? Yes, and it's all professional judgment. It's all um, just within uh, our discussion within our office. Yeah. Normally, you, you, for a risk assessment, you, you might have five categories, but you win seven. Excuse there, me? Normally, when I see a risk assessment, mm -hmm. I, I normally see five categories. Seven is, um, can you tell me why you picked seven? Well, I um, base it on a sample of other risk assessments um, from the city auditor to uh, the local um, higher ed, and these were the ones that I thought were most relevant for us. You, generally, you will see um, compliance risk, reputation risk, strategic risk, and um, the budget risk. I think those are the four most um, common. Uh, I do think we've observed that um, change in management and the newness of, um, of a leader in an area does also contribute to the risk in that area. Um, so that's why we've added that. Um, management interest, uh, we added, you know, I took a look at the city's um, risk assessment. I saw that and I thought that, I thought it might be a good idea to fit into ours as well. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm just, uh, it's like, um, how do you come up with, with, some of these are subjective or are they? Uh, they're absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I also noted on uh, your weighted totals on the uh, right hand corner, the, the blue highlighted numbers. The Those blue highlighted were the ones that uh, moved forward to our audit plan. Um, you'll notice that there are a couple like special education is one that's highlighted as higher risk. That, um, although you don't see special education listed here, it is part of our follow-up audits. We did an audit of special education last year, so we will be um, including it in our follow-up review this year. And also, um, another question was, um, let's say six months from now, there mm -hmm. are some changes in it. Will you uh, update or revise this? Uh, Oh, most definitely. Um, you know, risks can uh, change at any point of time. Something can come up that proves to be a, more significant and would um, take the place of something else that then becomes less significant. Uh, it can be considered a live document, and it is flexible. Okay, good, good. I, I appreciate your, uh, your presenting this in, a, in such a format that is uh, a little bit... Um, for me, it's a little easier to read and understand and look up. Um, and so I really appreciate the work that you and your team have put into this. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have one more question. Reference the, you know, looking at the, the weighted totals and those that you have highlighted, you, had, you have career and technology. Do you have that included because of the fact that of the amount of money that they spend or are the different yes, streams and also of the, the money? Yes, the coding um, that's required and uh, it's, it came up in a few um, discussions that we had with leadership. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, appreciate your answers. I think mm -hmm. uh, we uh, appreciate, uh, you know, understand what you're trying to accomplish as far as the audit and like I said, audit, internal audit is always a very necessary department and to keep us, all of us, all of us on the right path. And so that way, if we are deviating a little bit, we can get back on it without any big problem. 
with your assistance, of course. Any other questions? No, I, I didn't want to. Well, piggyback on what you say, you know, we, we seldom ever talk about this, but this is to me something that's very, very um, important as we move and we evolve as a district and to constantly be looking at what we have and where we're at. And of course, there might be some discrepancies, et cetera, but it's, it, it's, I think it's, it's, um, it's part of the necessary duties that we have, and then you're the one that actually executes all the hard work. So I appreciate that. It's, it's quite an important topic in, in my estimation. It has been since I've been on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Also, and I appreciate the hard copies because it's a lot easier for me to go back and, and look at it instead of trying to of do course. it through, through the computer screen. <laughs> Old school. Of course. Okay, and if there are no other questions, we want to thank you for coming tonight and uh, appreciate your hard work as well as your teams. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome on board. Thank you. We will now open the public hearing on the Texas Assessments Performance Report presentation. Following the report, the public is invited to ask questions or make comments. Dr. De La Torre, please lead us into the Texas Ass Assessment Performance Report and presentation this evening. Thank you, President Ochoa, members of the board at this time. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Brenda Chacon, our Chief Academic Officer, to lead uh, in this presentation. Good evening, President Ochoa, Dr. De La Torre, members of the board. Uh, tonight we have Dr. Medellin who will present the presentation to you. As you know, this is an annual report required by TEA to report to you. This is our 21-22 data, uh, which was the year that we uh, came back officially from COVID. So without further ado, Ms. Dr. Medellin, it's all yours. Thank you very much and good evening. Uh, we would like to present to you the last official um, set of data from the 2021-2022 school year as required by uh, state and federal law. Um, the statute governing uh, taper reporting includes uh, uh, Texas Education Code and federal uh, requirements, uh, both for providing you information and for masking specific information to maintain confidentiality of, of students. The, re the performance report contents, um, we're not going to go through every single entry here, but all of these uh, pieces are required to be publicly available um, every year. All of these reports have to be provided to the public exactly in the same format as the Texas Education Agency provides it to us. And those are all already uh, ready for, for public consumption in our uh, district website. So we're going to go just to a couple of things here, uh, a little bit of academic performance, a bit, a bit of some of the pieces that we are required to provide you. All of this information, again, is uh, fairly old. We've, we've seen all of this, but it takes some time for the Texas Education Agency to finalize any appeals they may have throughout the state and things like that. And so it, it comes to us several months after the fact. On academic performance, uh, the percent of students that were rated at approaches grade level or better in our district in reading, math, science, and social studies, uh, you can see our, the performance is, is good compared to the region and comparable or higher than it is for the state. And so overall, at the approaches grade level, we were doing um, very well in 2022. When we look at longitudinal uh, performance, and this is, this is a, a slide that we would like to include here because we are still looking at recovering from COVID. And so where we were in 2019 compared to 2022, we have made quite a few improvements um, uh, uh, recovering from COVID, but we have not quite reached, at that point, we had not quite reached the levels of performance that we had seen in 2019. So we still have a little bit of ground to, to make up on that sense. When we look at regional scores, we can see that 
overall, all students, it, you will see that a large number of our grade levels in student populations are performing as well or better than everybody else in the region and the state. Uh, this is uh, at the approaches at, for all students. Specifically, if we look at our special education students, you will see that across the board, uh, our special education students perform better than anybody else in the region, higher than the state. Um, our, our teachers and administrators do an excellent job preparing our students, and it shows here on our special education population. You can also see for EL students, the level that approaches grade level, uh, the large majority of grade levels were above the regional, um, the, the major districts in the region and the state. And so at the approaches grade level, uh, across the board, the district has been preparing students um, at a higher level than everybody else. When we're starting to look at meets grade level, the performance of our students is better than it was across the region. If you'll notice, reading, math, science, and social studies, they were all higher than, than everybody else in the region. However, the state started to give us a little bit of a, of a, a game there where they, there are some across the statewide that certain subjects, the state is performing, the statewide is performing a little bit higher than, than the district. Here on the mid grade level, we can see again that we are gaining ground again. Um, on reading, for example, we have surpassed where we were in 2019, but the other subjects still uh, are behind where we were. And so when we're comparing to ourselves, we're still not quite where we were uh, before the pandemic hit. Regionally, you can see that many of our grade levels at the mid grade level are performing better than the region. And our high school students, everybody, um, English two, Algebra one, and Biology are still higher than the region and the state. And the other two subjects are comparable. So even at, at this uh, higher rigor level, we are doing fairly well compared to, to the region and the state. For our special education students, you can see that we, again, sweep the board. Uh, they are performing better in, in every subject, in every grade level. And our EL students, there is um, high school students, they are performing better again as than the state and, and the other districts. And our sixth grade and up, they are still performing quite, quite well as well at, at that level. Once we start looking at the highest rigor at the master's grade level, you will notice that again, our district performed better than the region, um, even though the state still beat us in three out of the four um, subjects. And so there's still a little bit of, of, of work to do there. The percent change between uh, 2019 and 2022, we still haven't reached in, in most of those subjects, but we are well on our way to go back to where we were before. Again, regional comparisons at the master's grade level, we can see that many of our grade levels and high schools, again, are performing better, both for all students and for special education students, every grade level, every subject area, and EL students, every subject area in high school, and most of our grade levels in uh, three through eight are performing better. And so that is the star performance from 2022. If we were to look at academic growth between 21 and 22, we can see that our students grew more in reading and math than both the region and the state. Regarding graduation rates, our graduation rates have um, gone down a little bit from the class of 2020 to the class of 2021. This is part of, part of this can be explained because uh, the class of 2021, these are the students that spent all of 2020 during the COVID uh, pandemic and then half of 21, we were still trying to get them back and get them back to school and so it, it makes sense that, that that graduation rate be lower than the class of 2020 because they had basically most of, the, of most of their high school years before the pandemic. And so if you'll notice our, our five-year graduation rate uh, also went down, but it only went down by one-tenth of a percent from, from the class of 2019 to the class of 2020. And our six-year graduation rate uh, went down as well, but we are still 
graduating students, even if they are not graduating in four years, we're still graduating students on the fifth and the sixth year. And at the sixth year, we're graduating more students than the region and the state. So even if they quite can't fi couldn't finish during those four years, we kept them there and got them to graduate um, eventually. Now, when looking at dropout rates, uh, just a reminder, the dropout rates, the lower the better we have. And so you can see that we are doing better than the region and the state in both the four-year and the five-year dropout rate. We have lower rates. The dropout rate increased from, from the class of 2019 to the class of 2020 for the same reasons that we were talking about graduation rates decreasing, right? The six-year dropout rate is also quite lower, actually, than both the region and the state. So that is a testament uh, to campuses making sure that students feel as they are still part of, the, of that uh, campus and they continue to work on their, their academics until they get to graduate six years, uh, within the six years. Now for the college career and military ready graduates for the class of 2021, we can, we can see that we increased from the, the, the graduates of 2020 to the graduates of 2021 in spite of having issues with COVID and we were significantly higher than the state and the region in both. On the right hand side, you can see that the CCMR type that we had for, for 2021. And one of the things that I'd like to point out here is that if you notice, 81% 80, of our graduates were CCMR ready. Out of those 81% graduates, 70% were college ready and 34%, almost 35% were career ready. That means that there were at least 20% of our graduates that were both career and college ready. And I think that is a good testament that our, that our schools are trying to make sure that our students have as many opportunities and as, and as many positive experiences as possible. And so they end up having not only one, not only one um, choice, but two, right? They, they get out of our high schools and they, they can go and, and be career ready or, and be college ready at the same time. Now the PIMS Financial Standard Reports, this is just a standard report that the taper requires us to provide you. And this is a very vague type of information. It's, um, I think Mrs. Lieber can provide you a much better idea of, of how those finances are going. But the one thing that we can tell you here is the revenue source. The, the money that comes from the district, uh, I always think that this is an interesting graph because it tells us how different we are from other districts in the state. You will notice that um, our income, 60, two thirds of our income comes from state, from state funding and 17% from local tax. Compare for the rest of the state what only 40% is coming from local income and uh, from federal, from state income and 42% from local taxes. So we are much more dependent on state funding than, than the state as a whole. Now the expenditures by function, there are only a couple of things here that we like to point out. I would like to point out, for example, that we spend four percentage points more in instruction than the state as a whole. And so I think that, uh, that difference in expenditures is noticeable in the results that we see for our students. Now for the number of violent and criminal incidents, um, we can see that the percent of, of students involved in a violent and criminal incident is small. There, are, there have been um, just under 1.7% um, of the students involved in one of those, in those kinds of incidents. The great majority of those incidents are on the possession, sold, or use of marijuana and other controlled substances. Everything else, the percentages are very, very low. You can see that because there are stars. The two stars on, on the report means that there were five or fewer incidents or number of students involved. And so we have to protect them for confidentiality purposes. And so you can see that for the most part, these violent and criminal incidents are not happening in our district. Most of it is uh, marijuana or other controlled substances. Um, now, when we compare 21 to 2022, one of the things that we 
have to take into consideration here is that 2021, remember that m for a long part of 2021, students were not at the campus. And so uh, we talked about this last year in the 2021 taper, how the number of incidents had dropped so dramatically for that year. Well, now we're seeing a return to basically to the usual one. The, numbers, the number of valid or incriminated incidents in 2022 is not very different from the ones in 2019. So there, hasn't, there, there isn't any alarming increases. It's just that we're basically back to where we were before because students have now been in, in school all year long. And so there's, there's been more opportunities there um, for making wrong decisions. The performance of our graduates in higher education, um, you will see here a, a, a bit of a um, sad situation. The, the percent of our students that have enrolled in higher education from the class of 2020 dropped significantly from the previous years. Part of the, I mean, the reason for that is, is fairly obvious that the 2020 year was a year where many students decided that they did not want to do college courses online for the first time after graduating high school. Uh, across the nation, colleges saw a drop in um, enrollment. And so I don't believe this drop is specific to the district or due to anything that is happening in the district. This was just the worldwide issue on during the year for this the class that, that graduated in 2020. And the rest of the performance reports, I, like we said, it's available on our website and we have uh, detailed information on all of this information. And if you have any questions, I'll be um, happy to answer them for you. Dr. Mitty, I'm sorry, I can't see you. Uh, Dr. Mitty, on the controlled substances, um, I, you said marijuana, but, but also, um, I realize that vaping, like THC products, is a big problem in the schools. What other controlled substances? I mean, are we, are we also talking about just vaping in general with the non-THC products? Does that come under controlled substance? It, vaping without THC is not considered a controlled substance, to my understanding. These are the controlled substances are, are defined in the penal code. Okay. And so it is only the ones that have to do with marijuana, THC, and you know, uh, glue, those kinds of substances that, that we've known uh, from before. Okay, thank you. And then the second, I'd just like to make a comment on what you said about the higher ed. Um, UTEP and EPCC both reported solid spring semesters for enrollment. You know, the numbers are still not where they want them at, but they're, they're you know, they're, they're very positive and very upbeat about seeing the number of students re returning back to school and pursuing their, their, their goals, their life goals. So. I think that I'd like to think that that report's going to be improved. Um, I think the the emphasis for us as a district, though, <clears throat> is to uh, um, ensure that uh, that all our students have the same opportunities and that we see the same performance across the board for all of our schools and as they pursue their higher education, higher education or career uh, goals as well. Definitely, and I'm I look forward to next year when we can tell you that our percentages are back up. And, and students are once again going to college. Thank you. Go ahead. I just wanna say, I think this reflects the, the work that our teachers and, and employees are doing um, to bring our, our, our kids, our students back to where they need to be, all the effort that's been put in. And I think it also reflects in something that we've discussed as a board that we do need to put a lot of emphasis in middle school. Seventh grade in particular seems to stand out. So I, I think this gives, gives us good information for our path forward, so thank you. I do have something to say. It's gonna be interesting to find out whether our sixth grade going into the middle school uh, setting will make a big difference in that, uh, the scores. So that would be something I'd be really be interested in seeing data from. Yes, definitely. And when, when we did the analysis on what we were uh, talking about bringing the sixth graders into the middle school, the schools that already had sixth grade, we could see 
that eighth grade students who had spent three years in middle school performed higher than students that had spent two years in middle school, regardless of the school they were in. So yes, we are hoping that in three years time when these our sixth graders go through the entire middle school experience, we will see some, some rewarding increases. I, I do have a couple of questions, and uh, one of them is on the on those charts that you showed us that across the board for our district and the other districts, and that it was on the approaches, meets, and masters. Um, can you bring up one of them, please? There, yeah, that one. Uh, that was was well. That's for all masters. One thing that I did notice that our seventh graders were always uh, a little low there. Uh, what can you attribute that? I mean, it's across the board. It's not just uh, it's not just for this one. It's I saw that it's for the approaches, meets, and masters, and it seems that the seventh grade, uh, especially in math, was struggling with that. You are correct, President Cho. That is an area that we're working with. I know that last year when we presented this, that was an area of concern that Ms. Woodruff brought up. Um, there's a couple things that we attested. First of all, your eighth, your seventh grade students, 30% of them are on in, are in eighth grade math. So that is when the advanced track starts. So not all of 100% of seventh graders take seventh grade math. So a, th a third of them take it. The rest of them are taking your algebra one and eighth grade advanced math. So the students that are left is definitely an area of concern, and we are working to address those gaps for the seventh grade math. Okay. Yeah, that was going to be my question. How are we addressing the, that? Uh, and my other question was, these are seventh graders, so they're going to be eighth graders and ninth graders. This doesn't carry, carry with them uh, as, uh, as we try to remediate, uh, fix this. Uh, hopefully, they will come up to speed on the math so, they, so these um, uh, percentages will increase in the eighth and ninth or Correct, and if you see our eighth grade and ninth grade scores, specifically in Algebra One, we have the highest scores in the region where our students are scoring the 90, 60, 30. Uh, so the seventh grade curriculum is, again, an area of concern and something we're addressing with our teachers during PLC, during planning. We've had several sessions with them uh, and we continue to tackle them, but we do close those gaps in eighth and ninth grade. Yeah, and this was 2021. 20, Correct. Um, but I'm sure looking forward to 2022, how, how, how we are moving uh, ahead and helping our students uh, come up to speed. I know that, that uh, staying um, that one year and a half of the pandemic really, really threw a monkey wrench into our educational system. It, it did, and math took the biggest hit, uh, not only in the district, but across uh, the nation. And although we're closing that gap faster than the normal in math, we still have, a, they miss foundations. Well, that's a good point that our district is working hard to close yeah. that gap and um, it, it shows us as far as our scores, but uh, um, we just got to get better and better and better at it. We do. We have room for growth in seventh grade math. Well, thank you. Well, that's was, I just want to make sure that we, I, mean, I know it is, but for us, the board to understand that this is getting um, looked at, it's getting mm -hmm. um, the tension, the, and everything else so we can not let any of our population students uh, suffer because of the pandemic as well. Absolutely. There was another question, and that was in the pie chart, that said that this let us spend 4% more on instruction. Can you translate to dollars what 4% is? So, so the way that these numbers were calculated is that we looked at the total amount of money provided to the district and how it's broken down, how it was spent, broken down by different well, types. Well, yeah, I understand the percentages, but I would like to see an amount there sometime. We can, we can ask for, for that additional information. If yeah, you I, as you know, percentages to me are like um, a nemesis. I, I'd like to see some dollars behind, or some numbers behind that because. Definitely. I, I just want to make sure that the community knows that how much more are we spending to for our education and the investment we're making you know not just on our on our um, facilities or anything else but the actual investment that we're making for our 
for our kids and, and that are in school. And that's why I'm asking for that. I'm, you know, it's because you know, four percent. Okay, great. You know, but it's like, okay, how much did you spend on your insurance, uh, health insurance? Well, I spent this percentage of my income. Like, well, that still doesn't tell me anything. You know, how much real dollars are being spent to, to, you know, how much more this district is spending to educate our kids so we can bridge that gap and get there. That's why I'm asking those questions. We can, Absolutely. We can, I think Ms. Lieber's on too. So, Mr. Ochoa, I, I can't actually see the slide, but if we're talking about 4% of our operating budget is spent on instruction, then that's roughly $18 million. But I don't think that's what you're asking about. I think you're asking me 4% more than what the state, the rest of the state spends. Well, I just want to know what that 4% means. Yes. I think you answered it. Yeah, so it's four percentage points more than the state spends. So in our case, we'd have to have the identical revenue, right? But in our case, we're spending $18 million more on instruction than any like district. Every percent is worth about. And that is a significant number. I yeah. Mean, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not $18,000. It's $18 million. So that's what I was uh, trying to bring out. So our committee knows that we are... Um, on top of this and, and putting the, the resources behind it so we can, um, like I say, bridge this gap and get our, our students back to where they were, even farther ahead than they were in 2019. So that's our goal. That's what. Um, well, one of the things that I, that's just my idea of why uh, some, of the, some of the dropout rate and everything, uh, I heard that it's because uh, these students went back to work during that period of time, and they, they uh, you know, employment right now is a sky, it's pretty high. I mean, you can get a job. If you really want to get a job with, you can get out and, and get employment. So is that playing a factor in some of the, trying to get some of our students back, or, or why they drop out, because they can. So I will tell you that we have seen an increase this past year at Plato and Tejas, which are recovery schools. So their enrollment has actually increased, which means that the kids are coming back Good. and completing uh, their high school diploma. Um, so this is the year that we've seen increase, enrollment increase at both schools. So yes, we have seen them come back uh, this year more than any other year. Good. I mean, it's good to, to earn a living, but as you well know, the future is coming up. And a lot of these students need their high school diploma in order to be better prepared for whatever endeavor they, or any job that they want to do here in the future. And they need that high school diploma. Um, you know, it's good to make money, but you've got to invest in yourself so you can have a better future. Correct. Yeah, and that's we have by getting your increase. education. And that was it for me. Well, yeah, but I'm saying well, as far as comments. <laughs> no, as far as uh, asking how many more questions. <laughs> okay, well, then there's no other questions. Thank you so much. Thank Very you. well Thank presented. You. Okay, Secretary Lucero. Do we have anyone signed up to speak on a taper report? Yes, we do, President Ochoa. Arlinda Valencia. Good evening, President Ochoa, Dr. De La Torre, and Board of Trustees. I'm Arlinda Valencia, president of the Isleta Teachers Association. The presentation that Dr. Chacon just shared with us was exceptional. Many thanks goes to Dr. Chacon and her academic team for a phenomenal job, and it's through the leadership and support of Dr. De La Torre and the Board of Trustees that Isleta ISD has outshined the entire region. The fact that this district came back after the pandemic is remarkable and only verifies that our teachers, employees, and our students are second to none 
in the region. Many other districts look at Isleta to see how it's done, but in all honesty, the knowledge this district and its leaders have isn't easy to imitate. One proud fact that has me standing here is the fact that Dr. De La Torre has developed a great working relationship with the Isleta Teachers Association. Many of you board members have embraced us too, and we're very, very appreciative of that. Some of the district's success has come from us working together, especially during the pandemic. The fact that we work closely together has made us great allies. I'm here tonight to state that YTA will continue to support the great things that are happening in this district. The results tonight have shown us that teachers and employees are willing to work hard and do whatever is necessary to make our students and parents proud of belonging to YISD. Thank you. Mr. Ochoa, might I clarify the yes. response I gave you a moment ago? Okay, so I went back to our budget presentation from April. We spend $271.6 million annually divided between instruction, the curriculum, the instructional leadership, and school leadership. If that's 4%, then the rest of the state spends, it's about $10.5 million more than a peer district across the state. But Thank you, Ms. 271.6 is what we spend total on construction. Total. And I think that uh, speaks well, uh, Isleta, that we do make a big investment. Yes, we have had a bond issue. We have built these beautiful, nice, uh, big schools to house our teachers and our students. But we're also making a big investment in our edu ed educating our, our children, which is, I think is the, the goal. Like I said, we can't stress that enough. They come first before anything else, and those, that is why 4% to me is, eh, but you talk to me about dollars, and that makes a big impact. So thank you for clarifying that. Thank you, Ms. Valencia. Thank you. The, the public hearing is now closed. We will now discuss the agenda items as listed in the post-it notice of the regular meeting of Isleta ISD Board of Trustees for February 15, 2023, and related recommended motions with the superintendent and executive cabinet and receive responses to questions and or requests for additional information through the superintendent in preparation for deliberation and action on said items at the February 15, 2023 regular Board of Trustees. Please stop me if you have any questions or wish to pull an item. Consent item number one is minutes of the Board of Trustees workshop and regular board meeting January 11, 2023, 6 p.m. Consent item number two, minutes of the Board of Trustees superintendent evaluation meeting January 25th, 2023, 6 p.m. Minutes of the number three, Monthly financials for December 2022. Policy items, number one, revision to CB, local, state, and federal revenue sources. Number two, revision to policy CKC, local, safety program, risk management, emergency plan. Number three, Revision to policy FNG local student rights and responsibilities, students and parents complaints slash grievances. Excuse me, Mr. Ochoa? Yes, ma'am. Um, I placed at your, Monica placed at your places a single page where we have made a minor clarification to what was presented in the board book and by TASB. Um, just for clarification, based on a question that was presented to us, we've added the word if in two additional places. That's what's shown in red. So with, that's a minor revision to what we had placed in the board book. Okay, thank you. I don't think it has any big impact, but, uh, but it's a little, a little clearer. So it, It's okay. for clarification. Yes. Thank you. That was the word I was looking for. 
clarification. Any questions on this? Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I was trying to find my place here. Number four, thank you. Revision to policy, FO, local student discipline. Action items, action item number one, 2023 internal audit plan. Action item number two, request to the Texas Agency for class size waivers. Mr. President, yes, I do have a question on that one. Um, in looking at the numbers that we're adding to, um, to these classrooms, it's only about one or two more students uh, per classroom. But I'm here to ask if those numbers rise again, would we be coming back to add more, more students to those same classrooms? No, ma'am, thank you for your question. What will happen is if additional students are added, we can go up to 25, of course. We can put a substitute teacher in the classroom to have an extra set of hands. And if it becomes necessary, we can look at hiring someone temporarily outside of a contract. Okay. The reason why I'm, I'm asking about this is in our last report, we heard about the challenges that our teachers are facing. Um, we know that these challenges are real, and I can say th from my own experiences, kids are different now than they were um, a few years ago, actually. Things are harder. It's making it very difficult for teachers to, to, um, to do what we need them to do. And we're expecting a lot out of our teachers. We want to see, uh, we want to see improvements. We want to see closing gaps. We want to see all the things uh, as a district that we know are good for our children and we know that we need to do, but it also presents challenges to teachers. So I just want to make sure that, that we don't get cavalier and go, oh, yeah, it's just one, it's just two more students. Uh, I just want us to make sure that we keep that into consideration when we are uh, adding numbers to classrooms and understanding that even adding one more student to a classroom um, presents a challenge for the teaching staff. I'll continue to monitor closely for sure. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Um, let's see. It's item number three. Number three. Yes. Authorize the use of job order contract method for roof replacement at Parkland Elementary School. Action item number four. Approve award of phase four solicitation number 222004 RFP BP 1990. 10 Rio Bravo Middle School, Parkland High School, and Isleta High School upgrades and renovations. Okay, the consent. The order of the agenda has been approved. May I have an electronic motion on the, on the consent agenda item as listed on the agenda as recommended by administration? Ms. Ms. Woodrow. Mr. President, I move that we approve the consent agenda items as recommended by administration. Thank you. We have a second by Mr. Ramirez. Please cast your electronic votes. Votes are in. Six in favor, none opposed. Policy items. The order of the agenda has been approved. May I have an electronic motion on the policy agenda items listed on, on this agenda as recommended by TASB, including this letter specific language. Mr. Rosales. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I move to approve the, uh, the uh, Policy items, a policy agenda, items listed on this agenda, 
as recommended by TS TASB, including Isleta specific language. We have a second by Mr. Haggerty. Please cast your electronic votes. Votes have been cast. Uh, results are six in favor, none opposed. Okay, action items number one, 2023 internal audit plan. Is there any discussion? If no further discussion, um, may, I have a, may I have an electronic motion? Ms. Woodruff. Mr. President, I move to approve the 2023 internal audit plan as presented by the internal auditor. We have a second by Mr. Ramirez. Please cast your electronic votes. Votes have been cast. Results are six in favor, none opposed. Action item number two, request to the Texas Education Agency for class size waivers. Is there any further discussion? No discussion. I have an electronic motion. Mr. Ramirez. The request uh, to the Texas Education Agency for your class size waivers. I move to approve the district submission to the Texas Education Agency for class size waivers to allow certain pre K to fourth grade classes to exceed the 22 to 1 ratio. We have a second by, by Ms. Woodruff. Please cast your votes. All votes have been cast. Six in favor, none opposed. Moving on to action item number three. Authorize the use of job order contract method for roof replacement at Parkland Elementary School. Is there any discussion? No further discussion. May I have an electronic motion? Mr. Haggerty. Mr. President, I move to authorize the use of job order contract method for the roof replacement at Parkland Elementary School as providing the best value to the district and further authorizing the superintendent toward the job order to the contractor based on the recommendation of the evaluation committee in an amount not to exceed $5 million contingent upon final negotiations in-house council review and form 1295 certificate of interested parties. We have a second by Ms. Woodruff. Please cast your votes. All votes have been cast. Six in favor, none opposed. Action item number four, approve award of phase number four, solicitation number 222004, RFP, BP1910, Rio Bravo Middle School, Parkland High School, and Isleta High School upgrades and renovations. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, sir. Mr. Ms. Leeper, what's the scope of work at Rio Bravo? Refrigerated air and fire sprinkler upgrades and system controls is in this GMP. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Any other discussion? Okay, no further discussion. May I have an uh, electronic motion? Mr. Haggerty. Mr. President, I move to award 
Approve award of phase number four, solicitation, solicitation 222004 RFP BP 1910, Rio Bravo Middle School, Park and High School, and Estada High School upgrades and renovations for $5,070,900 to Baines General Contractors towards a guaranteed maximum price with the remaining packages totaling the guaranteed maximum price and estimated cost of construction presented at subsequent board meetings, contingent upon final negotiations, in-house council review, and form 1295 certificate of interested parties. We have a second by Mr. Rosales. Please cast your electronic votes. Votes have been cast. Uh, results are six in favor, none opposed. Before I adjourn, does anybody have any comments? So moved. No, oh, I'm I sorry. I got, I got ahead of myself. She was talking uh, to me. Sorry no comments? <laughs> May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. Adjourn. That was very, um, what do you call it, kindergarten? It was.